probably sometime in the middle of December 2019. We start hearing rumours, an outbreak of atypical pneumonia occurring in the city in China. 31st December, Wuhan CDC acknowledged that there was a series of mysterious pneumonia. My immediate reaction was, oh no, what a terrible way to start a new year. While the rest of my friends were counting down to the New Year's, I was on my computer trying to find out more about this disease. The number of cases has increased to 44, with 11 of them in serious condition. There's actually no clarity in terms of what actually had happened. We have to respond strongly, and that's what we do. We decided we'll give a brief to Minister at that time, who was Minister Gunn. We knew that when there's a big outbreak somewhere in the world, it's going to be not a question of if but when the disease will come to Singapore. On the 2nd of January, we convened our first internal meeting in, within the Ministry of Health to brief everyone so that everyone was clued in about what the situation was. And we invited a few additional people, and that included Liu Yixin. It wasn't that easy at the beginning in trying to decipher what went on. One of the things that we worry a lot is whether this is a condition with human-to-human -human transmission. And that is the most critical point. We started the process of trying to understand what are the clinical characteristics of the virus because we needed to provide guidance to the medical professionals. I must say that first thing that came to my mind is that maybe I'm a jinx to the organisation. Shortly after I posted into MOH, there were speculative reports in the news about a disease that was occurring in Wuhan. But to the credit of all my colleagues in MOH, we swung into action. Our standard operating procedure is to stand up early even when we're not certain if the virus is going to be a major problem. We have some early meetings to tell the hospitals to get ready, make sure that people are ready, or whether they have enough people, also whether they have enough stores, and if not, to order from uh, MOH. On the 2nd of January, warning order has already been issued to check our stockpile, pharmaceuticals, medical consumables, equipment, sufficient for our healthcare workers to make sure that they can do their job. Everybody in the world was doing the same thing. There was a need for us to make sure that we stockpile enough, that we had different sources that are available. It was towards the end of January 2020 that it became apparent that a lot of our existing stocks you know, from the suppliers being channeled to China. We see our orders being cancelled, we see long delays. When orders start being cancelled, uh, that is when you start to uh, worry. Lah. I think we were tight, but because of our efforts, we never did run out of supplies for healthcare workers. We realised that it's going to be beyond just Ministry of Health. They will involve so many departments, many ministries, many agencies. Let me apologise for dragging you here on the third day of the Chinese New Year. At the first uh, media conference, I hadn't even taken over as the Director of Medical Services yet. So there was, right at the back of this room, uh, listening uh, to uh, developments as they, as they pass. Then a few technical questions came about uh, the virus, the uh, infection. Maybe uh, Kenneth would like to elaborate. Uh, I looked around and I realised belatedly that he actually was referring to me. So I had to step forward go from the back all the way towards the middle of the room and answer that first question. Our assessment is the information still continues to evolve and it's not uh, conclusive enough for us to uh, make immediate changes to our current posture. That weekend of Chinese New Year, we diagnosed the first few cases of COVID-19. There was a need to kind of systematically study how these patients were presenting, how their illness was behaving. We are able to characterize the clinical manifestations very quickly. 
our data show us that the individuals diagnosed with COVID-19 at that point are already holding very high viral quantities in the respiratory system. When we had SARS in 2003, transmission infectiousness only happened when the patient was symptomatic. There was very, very little asymptomatic transmission. And we kind of thought that this might be the case for COVID-19. But for COVID-19, it does not behave in a similar pattern. And that becomes extremely difficult to identify someone without symptoms but carrying the virus. And it's equally infectious. I would say that uh, we somewhat underestimate SARS-CoV-2 or COVID-19. It really dawned on many of us that this is no SARS. This is really a global pandemic of the order of magnitude of Spanish flu 100 years ago. And in such a pandemic, a lot of the playbook that we had, those which worked well for SARS, for COVID, really needed to be adapted and changed. It was around the tail end of February into March where we needed to revisit the original assumptions we had made. There were a number of people who didn't have much symptoms at the time they were diagnosed or perhaps were even relatively asymptomatic. That meant you wouldn't know whether the person next to you in the street was infected and potentially transmitting infection to you as well. And that threw a big spanner in the works. We quickly realised that this was quite a different disease, different from SARS, different from pandemic influenza and different from other things that we were faced with. We needed to change a lot of our preparedness plans, to change our playbook, to adapt to the nature of this new disease. Singapore has moved to make it mandatory for people to wear masks as soon as they leave the house. Every time when there's new data, new evidence, we have to be prepared to change our position, to respond quickly, rather than to stick to the old position. We want to reassure Singaporeans. We want to share with them the facts. And uh, what we were most worried about were rumours that will create panic and create unnecessary problems for the whole system. So we wanted to make sure that we are as transparent as we can. Please. In being transparent, did require us to spend more effort to communicate. For quite a lot of the work that we do, there was a very short turnaround time. The meeting will take place in the morning and then by the afternoon, we'll have to do the press conference. Never in my life have I done it where we are driving to Istana for the meeting already and I'm calling my officer on the phone and saying, can you make these changes on slide XXX and then go ahead and send it to PM's office and we will use that deck to, to present. It was decided we needed to stand up a force to undertake testing at the national level. HPB was asked to look into setting up the ability to undertake 55,000 swap a day. We took in anyone who was willing to take up the job. When it was clear that we needed significantly a lot more capacity, there was a whole of government efforts looking into public and private partnership to build up the lab capacity. Our aim is to finish samples as soon as possible. But of course, with accuracy, we really don't have time because we are actually racing against time to get results out as soon as possible because we know that there are downstream processes after our results are released. The morning shift people will always try to clear as much as possible to uh, hand over to the afternoon shift. There are also two shifts for every weekend, every public holiday. So there's actually no rest periods. Because of fatigue, our brains feel like they are lagging. So we have our colleagues who always double check our work. So with that help, we managed to actually get still accurate results. Contact tracing is actually quite a difficult business. It is important as one of the components of our strategy to test, trace, isolate and quarantine individuals to stop the spread of the virus. So the entire process takes on average about 48 hours or two days. The person might not remember who were the contacts he or she might 
be in touch with. And so part of the contact tracing process is helping them to recover their memory. The community outbreaks occurred in part because of returning waves of Singaporeans. And they were, in some cases, literally fleeing a, a, a bad situation where they were. But once they came back to Singapore, we found quite a number of them. They were only symptomatic and testing positive a few days after coming to Singapore. They were coming into their homes, they were infecting other household members, and then infection was starting to emerge as local outbreaks here and there in the community. We knew that nursing homes was the weakest link because they were uh, patients who are most vulnerable to the illness. Even before the outbreak, we were already routinely surveying some of these nursing homes and hospitals, having a stricter posture for them compared to the community. So I set up a planning group for the elderly so that we have a focused effort to see how we can avoid the same kind of, I would use the word carnage, that we have seen in nursing homes overseas. The nursing homes have lived in accommodation within the same facility, and therefore, a number of the staff were in close proximity on a regular and daily basis with their clients and with the residents. So the risk then of infected visitors coming into the nursing homes and uh, infecting staff and residents was very, very high. A new cluster with 10 of today's new cases has been identified at the Lee Amui Old Age Home. I received a phone call at 8 in the morning on 31st March saying that we had the first index case at the nursing home. So I was like, OK, um, this got real. After the Liamui nursing home got hit, we had to almost effectively close out nursing home. I've never prepared for a total shutdown of my workforce. Where to find a step-in care staff and can they come in the next one or two days? We need to ensure that the nursing home staff feel comfortable, that they are able to look after the patients and that the nursing home staff themselves are not sources of transmission. Initial few days were very difficult because all the processes were all different and everyone was fearful. It was both scary and heartwarming at that point. Both the stepping care staff and my own staff, they stepped up to help. Yeah. From that, we learned and uh, made us increase our resolve to try to ensure that this is not repeated again in the other nursing homes. So we introduced a lot more measures such that we, we stop visitors from visiting and remove those patients who have been infected and exposed to a safe place that we monitor them closely to try to break the infection link in such homes. We're starting to see outbreaks occurring in one dormitory, in another dormitory. We quickly realised that it was just the tip of the iceberg. To allow our hospitals and emergency department to become choked will become a major disaster. In order to give us a chance to then to bring what was happening in the community under control, unfortunately, we had to put in place some draconian measures. We decided that it is a very important national decision and it goes beyond the MTF and we need the cabinet to be involved. And the Prime Minister, I think if I remember correctly, uh, he said, uh, let's sleep over it, think about it and come back tomorrow and discuss again and see whether or not we will proceed with it. Leading up to 7th of April, we had big outbreaks in some of the worker dormitories. Singapore has confirmed 10 new cases of COVID-19 infection. 74 new cases. 65 new cases. 287 new cases. There was a risk that the numbers would double every three to four days. And at that rate, we would be overwhelmed in terms of our hospital capacity and our healthcare capacity. The only way for us to prevent being overwhelmed was to force a break in transmissions. We came together, we presented different options. And for each option, we put out the pros and cons, how effective, what is the cost to society to do that. We actually had a few rounds of discussions as to whether or not we really should take the tough stance. Eventually, we decided that it is essential and we needed to provide a break for us to uh, better prepare our healthcare systems. 
We will therefore impose significantly stricter measures. This is like a circuit breaker. Circuit breaker is, um, I think, is a uh, uh, appropriate name, better than a lockdown. Because el electrical engineering, you know, circuit breaker helps to allow us to stop everything and to restart step by step. We have to dig into our reserves, and our, our only reserve in our medical fraternity is our healthcare clusters. We got the three clusters to come in to form the three anchor tenants to look after our purpose-built dorms, so that they could provide care to those migrant workers. Eleventh April, twenty twenty, Saturday, at about nine in the morning, there was an unknown number, and the person said. Lionel, I need your help. It was my CEO. And those five words uh, dramatically changed my life. There were more than 40 dorms across the whole island, so it was not possible for any single cluster to manage the whole lot. It was not only bringing people together. Many were redeployed from different institutions. Uh, some were volunteers, some were locums. Okay, don't touch the chair. Don't touch the chair. So we got the admin professions, people from HR, the administrators were all volunteering to work alongside the doctors and the nurses. You want medicine? Ah? What medicine? The short one? Ah? Yeah, today we'll give you medicine. One senior nurse recounted that she got a text message on the morning of the deployment, turned up for the briefing, and the next thing she was in scrubs in the dorms. This is a situation that is clearly out of our control. It was like a tsunami in slow motion. We could see this massive wave of cases coming towards us. So the mood was grim at best. Frankly, I did think at times, are we going to fail in what we were tasked to do? We realised that the men needed more than just medical attention. They needed assurance. A lot of them were anxious not only for their personal health, but for their livelihoods and also for their families back home. The medical teams became a source of contact with the outside world, where they could express maybe some of their feelings, their fears and their concerns. They had become like friends. There was a particular event where all the dorm workers uh, went to their windows. Um, they were whistling, they, was, they were shouting, uh, they were waving their handphones uh, as a sign of appreciation to the uh, healthcare workers. And for those who were present at that point in time, I think they found it very, very touching. Deploying resource from the public healthcare system wasn't sufficient. And therefore, they had to approach the private providers, either as a contingency or for deployment anyway. To be frank, it didn't come as a complete surprise that the request came. Our instinct was to step up to the plate and, and support the system. We had a duty of care towards the public. Uh, we wanted to contribute. Of course, after we said yes, then all the fears kicked in. <laughs> CCFs were one of the key facilities that we had to put in place. And these are, in essence, you know, mini hospitals. So it, it is really creating it from scratch and doing that at high speed. From basic stuff like making sure electricity could be drawn in and where would the sewage go to, the scale of which is something that was quite unprecedented when we first started. We were one of the first two medical providers involved in the setup of the CCF at Singapore Expo. Subsequently, we had more and more medical providers. It's very, very encouraging, uh, my experience there, to see 
so many different organizations coming together to help one another in order to achieve that goal of uh, keeping our, our people safe. The biggest question we had was how to avoid reopening and then you have a huge outbreak and then we have re reverse and then go into a lockdown again. I think psychologically, it would have been a big hit if we reopen, we lock down, we reopen, lock down in like what happened in many countries. There was one statement made by a decision maker. He said he does not want it to be his decision that would cost the lives of the people. Yeah. So therefore, he would rather err on the side of caution. So that was etched in my mind because it was a very firm conviction on what guided his decision and it really was to put lives first. So our job was to figure out how to turn on the switches and which switches to turn on before tripping the circuit breaker. By the end of April, we had to come up with our first set of recommendations. So we took a risk-based approach. We tried to assess which activities were more risky and less risky and which are the least risky ones which we could start off with. Singapore will ease out of its COVID-19 circuit breaker, reopening in phases from the 2nd of June. For uh, pandemics like this, there are three ways we can get out of it. One is uh, when the virus mutates to something that's harmless. Secondly, is to have an effective vaccine that can prevent the infection or prevent a severe outcome so that it became a mild disease. And that also allows us to exit this pandemic and live normally. Third way is to have effective therapeutics, drugs, treatment. Virus mutation is not something that we can control, but vaccine is something that uh, is going to be quite critical. We were hoping that vaccines would end the pandemic. That's light at the Amatana. 